Hey all, really nice to meet you. Um, I'm so amazed that so many people are, uh, are here. It's super exciting. Um, so uh, Melissa gave a little bit of information about me. Um, briefly, I'll just say that I have given uh, a number of workshops on boundaries before. Um, normally I like to do it in a more interactive style, but because of how they format things here at Center for Healthy Sex, um, this one is going to be a little bit more lecture oriented. Um, if you would like future workshops on this topic, um, more interactive workshops on this topic, uh, shoot me a message um, on my website, which we'll give you at the end. Um, it's samsilvermantherapy.com. And uh, I can potentially do another follow up workshop uh, through my website. So uh, briefly, I just want to say, um, I just wanted to acknowledge um, some folks whose ideas I pulled from. Uh, a friend of mine, Don Woodward, um, some mentors, some professional speakers, um, and some professional writers, uh, because no ideas uh, live in a vacuum. And I just, uh, a lot of these ideas are of my own creation, but also I, I, where would I be without all these wonderful influences? So um, why talk about boundaries? Uh, yes, I am going to be sharing. So someone asked, am I going to be sharing my PowerPoint at the end? I will share my PowerPoint at the end. Uh, and uh, you will get a copy of my PowerPoint as well as uh, a worksheet on suggestions for boundaries, as well as a link to my website where you can ask me more questions. It's no problem. Um, what I would love to do is have y'all reach out in the Q&A box and I would love to hear some folks share what are some of the reasons you think this topic matters? What are some of the reasons you think talking about boundaries matters? And take all the time you need. Safety. Um, Jenny, I think that's a really great suggestion. I would love it if you have more thought, like more thoughts about specifically what about safety. Um, Fan, good to see you here to prevent re-traumatizing each other and or traumatizing each other. Absolutely. Um, I only know who I am when I have a frame, when I have a framework around me. Absolutely. Poorly defined boundaries tend to make for poorly defined relationships, to maintain healthy relationships, discussion of, uh, let's see what else we say. Okay. Better boundaries as an overgiver. Ooh, that's a really good one. So to figure out what is like healthy supporting others and what is like healthy supporting ourselves, sanity. Um, Karen, I love that. Thank you for that, sanity. That's a really uh, nicely put. All right, I'm gonna pause you all here because there's like literally thousands, millions of reasons. Um, oh, to separate your own feelings from others. I like that one a lot. Thank you all for sharing. Um, I'm gonna pause you here. I'll, I'll keep those answers in mind for future though. Um, but I was gonna add, I think some other reasons that this is important. Um, I think that when you consistently don't know or ignore your internal boundary cues, um, your sense of who you are as a person, your sense of identity, your sense of self-esteem goes out the window. I think your ability to keep yourself safe, um, as was stated by others, your ability to keep yourself safe, your ability to know what your needs are, your ability to know the difference between unsafe and uncomfortable, your ability to, uh, your ability to get your needs met, have healthy relationships, all of that kind of goes out the window. Um, and so the more that you're able to know what your boundaries are and tune into them, uh, I think that that can be helpful in so many areas. Um, and even if you're not sure that you have, you're in a position where you care that much about your own needs, being a model for others is a huge resource for folks who are struggling with self-worth as, as just a starting point for caring about their own boundaries because how you show up is how you teach um, your kids, your partners, et cetera, to show up. Um, all right, so this is just gonna be a little brief overview of what we're gonna do today. Uh, so why boundaries matter, talked about that. Boundary self-assessment, this is where I give you guys a cute little quiz. It's the fun kind, not the graded kind. Um, and we're just gonna kind of talk about a sense of like what boundaries are. So some of these questions will give you a sense of what boundaries are, um, as well as a sense of where you're at in your own boundary process. So um, what are your strengths? What are your areas for improvement? Um, how self-aware are you of your own process? Maybe you get to a question and you're like, I have no idea, I haven't thought about that at all. 
that might give you some more information like, oh, I need to maybe spend some time checking in and noticing what's going on in, the, in these areas. Um, Self-knowledge is a really important part of boundaries. Um, and then that's also something you can use to help identify the next steps of like what actual concrete action steps do I take? Um, next, we're gonna talk about your internal yes and no in your body, how to know what's a yes and what's a no. Um, because I think this is the most simple and direct way to start conversations about boundaries. So do I want ice cream right now? Not particularly, I just ate breakfast. That's my internal no. Okay, right, do I want a million dollars? Yes, that sounds great. That would be excellent, fantastic, internal yes. Um, and we're gonna talk more about that, what cues to look for, how to know the difference, um, as well as some things that get in the way of us being clear about our boundaries. So um, trauma, being emotionally overwhelmed, guilt, shame, those are some things, as well as social norms, social systems, family expectations, um, partner expectations. Those are all things that can kind of fog up or cloud our internal yes or no. They don't make it go away, but they can make it harder to cue into. Um, and then if we have time, and this is gonna kind of depend on how many questions there are and if this goes as fast as I think it will go, TBD, I'd like to do a little bit of a boundaries mindfulness practice to get you in touch with some like specific moments um, where you were really cued into your boundaries and some moments where you weren't so much and kind of how to notice the difference. Um, and then time for questions. And then I'm gonna send you all off with some boundary tips uh, and tricks. It's gonna be like a, like a take home worksheet um, and you'll get that if you registered for this workshop, you'll get that in an email along with the PowerPoint. Um, any clarifying questions about that so far? Okay. So this is the part. If you have pen and paper, if you want to do it in a Word document, if you want to just read it and not necessarily write down your answers, any of those are fine. Um, but please, please, please don't write down word for word each question because you'll get a copy of this. And if you do that, it's going to take 8 million years and we won't end on time. Um, but for these, for this, so this is the short boundary self-assessment. So what I'd like you all to do is take a minute and read over these um, and just see if you can answer these questions to the best of your ability with where you're at in your boundaries. So currently I would rank my ability to set boundaries healthy boundaries with myself and others as blank out of 10. I would probably rate my ability to set healthy boundaries with others and myself as like eight out of 10. I think I'm pretty good at it, but I think there's always room for improvement. And then this is kind of to check, do, am I at where I think that I'm at? So I'm gonna answer these other questions and see. Um, and you're not writing an essay, you're just rate, rating each zero to 10. 10 is perfect every time, and zero is I've never successfully done this, not once in my entire life. Um, so just take a minute. I'm just going to give you guys a minute to look over these questions and, and just check in and self-assess your boundaries. Paul, I appreciate you sharing that. Paul says, my answers are pretty context specific, uh, depends on who I'm interacting with, which absolutely I think is true for most of us. I think how I am with my boss is different than how I am with my family is different than how I am on a date. Um, or with a friend. Um, so these are, you're looking for kind of like general themes, but absolutely you could take this whole self-assessment and do it relationship by relationship and kind of see what are the specific things I want to work on in that relationship if there's a specific relationship you want to focus on. Um, definitely, I appreciate you sharing that. All right, just take another 30 seconds and take this time. If you're not done, that's okay. Um, I promise I'm not grading. And just take this moment to see if you can note one area, one question where you're like, yeah, I'm really good at that. And one question where you're like, mm, that's, really, that's really something I wanna work on. All right, so I would love for folks to share 
Um, just a few, I'm just gonna read a few responses, not all of them for the sake of time, but what are a few areas that you found that you were actually pretty good at? Listening and taking feedback from others, validating, validating and affirming others' no's, saying no to things that are bad for me, communicating without anger, passive aggression or insults, honoring other people's no's, saying yes and pushing myself. All right, great. Um, I'm noticing a theme and this is not true for everyone. Oh, Courtney says communicating directly about my wants and needs. I think often there is a theme. Um, I don't know if this is true for the general population, but I think for the population, uh, percentage of the population that chooses to attend workshops on boundaries, um, where uh, there's kind of a theme of being good at caring for others, being good at knowing what others want and need, uh, being good at respecting their boundaries, but having trouble advocating for your own or sometimes even knowing what your own boundaries are. Um, and so that can be a really difficult balance. Um, what about for, uh, if folks wanna just share one or two things that they feel like they really need to work on? Self-respect, that's definitely an important one and it's a hard one. Recognizing your own needs, for sure. Uh, communicating without feeling guilty and fig figuring out how to communicate your needs without feeling guilty. Guilt is such a powerful force. I could do a whole workshop just on guilt. Um, and I think figuring out how do I notice the guilt but not see the guilt as representative of me necessarily doing the wrong thing or doing a bad thing, but as a representation of where I'm at in my relationship with setting boundaries um, or a relationship of what I've learned I'm supposed to do or not supposed to do, but not necessarily what I want or need or believe. It's tricky. All right. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind as we go through these to get a sense of, I think that gives you a good sense of some of the topics that boundaries include. So things like respect and communication and knowing your needs, um, knowing, knowing what might be helpful for you in the long run, knowing what might be uncomfortable but might be something that you know you want or need anyway, um, taking in feedback. So the next piece I want to talk about, and keep in mind that this is an hour workshop with 10 minutes for questions, so this is going to be heavily summarized. Just to summarize um, a little bit about marginalization, oppression, social learning, safety, and boundaries. Um, this is such a broad topic. I am coming at it from the perspective of someone who is queer and trans and able-bodied um, and has struggled with uh, some chronic illness issues, but no longer um, and uh, has a decent amount of financial privilege um, is um, yeah. So, so the things that I've experienced and had access to, um, I'm not going to be perfectly aware of everything and I'm trying to do my best um, and I'm sure others will have more insight and things to share. Uh, so as far as some things to say about this, please ignore my typo, first of all. Um, I meant to say women and marginalized folks, uh, as well as many trauma survivors, learn to navigate their social situations based, based on tuning in to others' comfort or discomfort rather than their own needs or safety. Um, because for many of us, the way that we have learned to navigate the world is based on, okay, well, if they're comfortable, if they're at ease, then I am safe, then I'm going to remain employed, then I'm not going to lose this relationship, then I'm not going to get yelled at, whatever the case may be. Um, and this is not, this is not something that we learn because we're bad or wrong or crazy. This is something that we learn because many of the times this has been true. Um, and so we learn to kind of tune out and disconnect from our own needs and focus on others' comfort. And that unlearning process is so important and valuable when learning our own boundaries, but also involves having spaces that we can be in more and more of the time where people are interested in hearing and respecting and listening to our boundaries. And it's 
really, really hard to do that unlearning process if we continue to be in an environment that dismisses or downplays our boundaries. Um, I also want to briefly speak to systemic gaslighting, uh, ideas that if you are a person who expresses emotions, um, especially if you are, um, God, a man who's ever had a feeling, uh, you know, a woman voicing a need in the workplace, a person of color talking about uh, a need or racism or oppression, um, there's this idea that you're too sensitive, too much, too loud, um, and trying to figure out how is their reaction not relevant to the validity of my boundaries? How is their reaction more about them? And also, how do I live and cope in a world in which that reaction is common? And how do I navigate my boundaries according to what I need, but also the reality of the world I live in? Um, and how do I do that in a world of daily microaggressions and macroaggressions and small, uh, small moments where people will say things, will comment on things like, um, you know, uh, as a trans person where people will say things about my pronouns uh, or, or um, as, you know, as women, I think there's so many things that you're told about uh, ways in which, like, what if, what if you're just, you know, overthinking this or being too sensitive, all these other ideas, those are examples of microaggressions. And the more those happen, the more it's so easy to internalize, why bother? Because this is an ongoing issue. My needs aren't going to be met. So why would I bother expressing it? And so I think having these conversations and finding supportive partners, therapists, friend groups to unlearn that and to have support so that then you can have more agency and choice in when do I opt in to this advocating for myself and when do I decide that this is too much emotional strain and when do I get support. Um, and it's not an easy thing to navigate. It's not. Um, yeah, I think supportive people make a huge, make a huge impact. I also think recognizing that these systems, this gaslighting, this marginalization, isn't, it isn't like a one-time thing that you're like, oh, well, I learned that that was bad, but now I can move on from that and never deal with that again. It's an ongoing struggle of continuing to live in a world with those experiences and also continuing to try to unlearn using those external, external cues to decide what boundaries are valid or invalid. Um, and that's hard, like beyond hard. Um, and I think having other people doing that work with you and having open conversations about it matters. Um, and, and the last thing I wanna say on this is struggling with boundaries is also not intrinsically something bad or wrong about you. I think concept about boundaries, well, they don't have to mean this. I think when people use words like codependent, for example, I think often the implication is um, you are codependent because you're not setting enough boundaries and you need to work on that, right? As opposed to, um, I think a better or more accurate way of putting it would be um, you have internalized a lot of ideas from how you were raised, how you grew up, the world you live in, ways you've been treated about how to get your needs met. And those were real ways you learned to get your needs met that are valid and also probably not as sustainable as you would like. And so this is a process of noticing without shaming all these external messages you've internalized and then to shift that narrative for what do I want? What do I want my relationship with these boundaries to be? And what actually feels healthy and healing and sustainable for me? Um, and again, it's tough. So this is a broad topic that I do not have all the answers on. One amazing uh, resource that I would suggest on this in general, though, is um, Sonia Renee Taylor, who uh, wrote a book called The Body Is Not an Apology, who does some amazing work about what is it like to make more space for others, to make more space for ourselves, to not be in a position of constantly apologizing when we've done nothing wrong? What is it like to take accountability? 
and just like how do we do that while navigating all these social systems going on um oh yeah and absolutely uh erica thank you so much for adding that absolutely it's not just um it's not just the groups that i mentioned that experience this so it's not just women that experience um this like you're too sensitive talk it's also i think there's also a lot of stigma that is put on femmes um, in general. I think there's a lot of stigma that's put on non-binary people. So like, I appreciate you adding that. Thank you. Um, any questions with the context that uh, this is a big topic and I cannot cover all of it, but any things, especially any things that um, marginalized folks wanna add that they think that I missed or didn't, um, didn't cover enough give you guys a second to add anything. I'll give you all a second. Um, Van adds, not being realistic is another big gaslighting one for sure. Um, uh, like you have to be practical or we can only make so many accommodations or this is just how it is or, you know, kind of uh, just put on your big boy pants kind of talk when like that is a way of that other person saying, I am uncomfortable that you expressed a need or a boundary, right? Or I don't know how to integrate that need or boundary because this is new to me, scary to me. And so I don't know how to speak about it, how to deal with it. So I'm going to put that back on you for sure. All right. I don't see any other comments, but feel free to add stuff later on. Um, so window of tolerance and boundaries, I'm just briefly checking the time, window of tolerance and boundaries. So um, normally if I were, if there were videos, I would say raise your hand if you've heard of the concept of window of tolerance, but I'm gonna go out on a limb and guess that some of you have and some of you haven't. Um, so basically what I'm gonna say is it's an understanding of when am I so overwhelmed or disconnected from my when am I so overwhelmed or underwhelmed that I'm having a hard time being grounded enough to get in touch with my wants and my needs? Um, so, for example, um, I have this little visual here, um, and this is like your window of tolerance, right? Which is the ability which within which you can make decisions and set boundaries that afterwards you will feel good about. You won't regret, you won't, um, usually they're, you're, you're grounded enough to be able to kind of be in touch with what you're feeling. Um, that doesn't mean that you're not anxious or depressed or numb, but it, it means you're grounded enough to be able to make decisions that you feel good about after and to be able to be in touch with your needs and wants and act accordingly. Um, and then up here, right outside of your window of tolerance um, on like on the top of the window basically would be where you get to the point of overwhelm where it's really hard to figure out what do like it's really hard to get in touch with your actual wants and needs and, and feelings so above the window of tolerance that would be like heightened emotions so that would be any kind of hyper any kind of hyper arousal so panic uh anxiety um, anger, uh, overwhelmed, racing thoughts, uh, racing heartbeat, any of that kind of stuff. Um, when you're here, it's harder for you to tune into what your boundaries are. And for example, if there is a bear in the room that is trying to maul me to death, I am not going to sit down and have a cup of tea and think about what do I need right now? And what am I feeling in this moment? And like, let me check in with myself. I'm going to be like, ah, bear, I would like to run from the bear now, please. Or whatever you're supposed to do with bears. I don't remember. Um, I'm not a wilderness expert, but like, I'm not going to be thinking about and tuning in mindfully to my boundaries. I'm going to be like, ah, bear. But of course the brain doesn't only do that when there's a bear in the room. It also does that when we have reminders of a time when a bear was in a room, when we think about a time that is, looks similar to a time that a bear was in a room, sometimes even just being in the same room that the bear was in, right? And so having a sense of um, all of these things and recognizing that even if we're not actively in danger or even if no one is necessarily harming us, we may still have 
panic, anger, fight or flight responses. Um, and so the most helpful thing to do when thinking about boundaries is, except for in crisis, actual crisis situations, to try to get back to your window of tolerance before making any major decisions and to try to get back into your window of tolerance before checking in with what your boundaries are. And then down here, we have kind of like the hypo arousal, like the lower energy emotion. So that's like numb, depression, apathy, shut down, zoned out, disconnected, dissociated, um, all of those kind of emotions. Um, and that also can be a time where sometimes we're just like, doesn't matter, I don't care, whatever. Um, or we might, you know, kind of go along with something that's not really feeling right for us because it just feels, we just feel so disconnected from our ability to be grounded and make a decision. Um, so I know that's like a lot of things. Um, so I just wanted to see if you have any questions about how that all works before I, um, before I kind of talk more about it, just like how the window of tolerance works. I'm gonna go ahead on, but if, you, if I see any questions, I will, I'll check in about them. I see a few other questions that are general, and if it's something that's not an immediate question about this, I'm gonna save it till the end. So I was gonna say, um, that I was gonna give an example of some emotions. So some emotions that might get in the way of our ability to be clear about our boundaries, things like guilt, shame, embarrassment, shutdown, depression, um, can, get in, can kind of fog over this internal compass of yes and no. Um, and to give an example for myself, I am someone who, I have mild asthma, so I'm an immunocompromised person during a pandemic who is also an extrovert. So trying to figure out what my boundaries are, for example, if someone is like, would you like to do a social distance meetup? Um, it is tr so tricky to figure out what is kind of the social part of me desperate for that connection. What is kind of just the irrational fear, panic talking? what is like a practical decision, right? And then what actually like feels right in my body. Um, and it's a really, really tricky balance. And when I try to analyze it, what I often end up doing is coming up with a decision based on either what's gonna please the other person or based on a response to the fear of, ah, that's too overwhelming. Um, and not really mindfully making a decision. And so one of the things that I've taken to doing is saying like, let me think about it and get back to you tomorrow. And like waiting until I feel a little bit more grounded and, and less like impulsive and then sitting on it and then checking in and going like, yeah, I think, and sometimes the answer I come up with is I need more information. Sometimes the answer I come up with is like, okay, well, can you tell me more about some of the safety protocols you're taking? Can you tell me more about like, if you or anyone you're interacting with is working outside the home, when were you last tested, things like that. And then I might check back in again, right? And, and also having the kind of people that I'm interacting with who are respectful of that process. Um, and for me, that's also a huge sign that I'm gonna feel more comfortable interacting with them or potentially making a small risk to interact with this person at a social distance is, okay, are they respectful of my boundaries in this context, they might be more likely to respect my boundaries in other contexts. Um, but yeah, when you can kind of ground yourself and get in touch with your internal yes and no, um, that can be super helpful and being outside your window of tolerance is one thing that can get in the way of that. So how do you get back to your window of tolerance? So how you get back to your window of tolerance, it so depends on the person and your, and your what you find grounding, but some general tools are time, um, venting, uh, meditation, breathing exercises, um, pretty much to get back to your window of tolerance, it's like one of three areas that I would say. So one is speed up, one is slow down, and one is connect. So speed up would be like, um, go for a walk, dance, sing in the shower, um, like move your body in some way, uh, might be like, 
rip up a piece of paper with uncomfortable feelings on it. it might be like flail your arms, uh, slow down would be like meditate, stretch, deep breathing, breath work, uh, might be like spacing out and distracting to TV for a little bit. And then connect would be like uh, talking to um, another person, might be venting, might be sharing, might be asking, have you ever been through this? I just wanna feel less alone in it. Um, and then though that's not an all encompassing list, but that just to give you some ideas. Um, fawn is something, I'm glad you asked about that. Um, so I can go more into these other triggers. I'm specifically not going too deep into them because that could be a whole other topic. But basically, um, I actually link an article at the end of this. But basically, fawn is when it's almost like habitually people pleasing. It's like when you, um, your tendency is to decide how to move in a particular dynamic or relationship based on how you think the other person will react in a specifically almost in a traumatized way. Like I'm gonna, um, I'm trying to think of a good example. Um, let's see. Um, and I also got questions about the fuck trigger. So basically these are the Fs of trauma responses. And, um, and it's not, by the way, this is nothing about sex being bad. This is, it's a very sex positive. This is more about noticing if, for example, if you find yourself getting horny or aroused or wanting to go have sex in response to a particularly stressful situation or in response to like feeling really overwhelmed or checked out or numb, that can be a sign that that might be um, like a, that you're outside of your window of tolerance and you're having some kind of trigger. Um, again, it's not bad, it's just something to notice. Um, and fawn, I'm not gonna go too much into detail about it because I'm having my a brain fart and I can't think of a good example, but there is a whole article on it that I'm gonna link to you at the end of this PowerPoint. Um, okay. Um, oh, okay, I am gonna play. Yes, I do have enough time. All right, I'm gonna play for you guys. Um, and I see that there are other questions and I will come back to uh, this um, at the end uh, for more questions. Um, I wanna play you guys a video, I wanna play y'all a video that is an example of uh, getting in touch with your internal yes and no and it's me and my friend having a dialogue about that using some example questions. So I'm gonna jump to that, kind of introduce Ironically, the concept that you introduced to me, which is a very helpful concept about uh, body scanning and tracking and learning your internal yes and no. So I know you very well practiced at this. Oh, and I forgot to say briefly, sorry, that this is with my friend Dawn, who uses they, them pronouns, and uh, is the executive director of Sex Positive World. Um, are you open to me asking you some quick and silly questions? to assess your internal yes and no. Okay. So I'm gonna start off with a couple of questions. And when I ask you this question, I want you to not say yes or no. I want you to just answer instinctively with noticing anything's coming up in your body. If you need a second to scan and check it out, totally fine. Um, any areas of tension, pressure, tingling, numbness, hot or cold, any areas in which you're noticing that you suddenly don't notice tension or pressure, um, like shoulders and neck and, and forehead, um, any areas where you're noticing a desire, is there a desire, any kind of flight or flight desire? Is there, you know, any kind of increased blood flow to your, to your extremities, right, is another thing to look for. Um, butterflies in your stomach, does that, do you feel like you have a clear, I know you've done this before, but pretend you haven't. Does, do you feel like you have a clear sense of what's, that, what the exercise is? That's a helpful list. I like that you go through all of those first. Thanks. Um, so first question is, would you like a million dollars? I notice an instant relaxing of tension sort of in my diaphragm and stomach mm -hmm. 
and I noticed just sort of lightness throughout my body. Um, yeah, I think kind of general relaxing throughout, but I specifically noticed like along my arms um, and legs just a little like, wow, that would change my life. Yeah. Uh, kind of, yeah, would relieve a lot of tension that I carry. So I think I could feel that all happening in the moment. Um, yeah, it sounds like you, you're pretty in touch with your body sensations uh, I, I think I kind of get the sense of the answer, but if you were to put that in yes or no terms, uh, what would that be? That's a pretty hell yes answer. <laughs> yeah, so that's a pretty clear, pretty clear hell yes. Okay, so you have a good body context for what a yes means. So some of the things that a yes is, and obviously there's going to be some difference answer to answer, but some things you notice with a yes, you notice, um, you said some relaxing, right? Um, that one was a lot kind of relaxing and lighter feeling. And lighter, definitely. And you said like there was also, um, you said something shifted in your diaphragm. Yeah, specifically my diaphragm was the first thing that dropped a lot of tension when you said that. Yeah. Yeah. So like breathing easier kind of. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Literally and metaphorically. Um mm -hmm. So those are some, some kind of indicators to keep in mind um, if you're feeling unsure about something for what your yes looks like. Those indicators may be more subtle or more clouded in a situation that's not as hell yes, right? Or where there's more stress or background noise of fear, or guilt, other things going on. But that's just to kind of give you a sense of your own yes. Um, and it definitely varies by context, having yeah. done or I know if somebody's asking me for something physical, my hell yes is going to be kind of more targeted toward that thing. And I'll usually have a little bit more kind of like sparkly tingly mm -hmm. around physical hell yeses. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, it's good. It's super good to know. Yeah. I tend to tighten, I think more, but like tighten in excitement with physical hell yes responses. And then for like, something like a million dollars or something like an, an offer that would make my life easier. It makes yeah. sense. I have this sort of like relaxing mm. response. So I'm going to pause it here and I'm going to show you one more clip of the video. Um, but I just wanted to say this can be a moment for you to think about and kind of track and notice what your yes looks like. Um, and you can kind of come in with a question that you already know is a yes to then work backwards to what is my body cue for a yes. So maybe you already know you're hungry. So you could say, do I want something to eat? And you could notice what that looks like in your body. Or maybe you already know that you're, <laughs> one of the questions you could ask is, am I going stir crazy in this pandemic? And you already know the answer is yes. And so then you can ask, um, you can ask yourself that and notice what comes up in your body and maybe track and notice what different yeses look like in different contexts, like Don was saying. Um, and then the other, the next thing I wanted to add, um, I wanted to add that um, for one of the things that I did with Don next, um, we went on to talk about more about what a no looks like, but then we specifically talked about uh, a specific no context based on um, a specific struggle with yes or no based on one of the issues that Don brought up that they were struggling with. So they mentioned based on the quiz um, that they also, I also had them take, they mentioned one area they're struggling with is um, basically when the, when they feel like something is like a no, but they really want to do it. Meaning like they're too busy, too tired, too overwhelmed, but they feel like, there's kind of like both a sense of that would be fun and a sense of obligation. Um, and so then we go on to talk about that in the next little clip I'm going to show you. Would you like to have to go uh, back to work in person where all your colleagues are working in person and not wearing masks? Instantly, I sort of collapse down here. Yeah. Um, in a sort of like defensive posture. Yeah. Um, and there's more tension in my chest um, and kind of like 
sinking pit in my stomach around how much work that would be right now, I think is the main driving factor in response to that question. Because I'm already stressed in my life and I can't imagine taking the time to move back to work tomorrow. Yeah. So if you were to interpret that in yes or no terms, what would uh, that be? Hell no. Yeah. Uh, lots of tension, lots of retreating back. And yeah. So some things happening with your shoulders, some tension, some, some like tra almost like making yourself smaller, or shrinking away. Yes. Yeah, definitely. So it seems like we have some good ideas of what yeses feel like and what noes feel like. Obviously, there's going to be some variation and some things that, but it, it gives you a, like a kind of a framework for things to look for. Um, so now I want to go back to the situation that you pose that's like a, a source of struggle. Um, so would you like to uh, tomorrow skip work to attend a uh, sex positivity conference with me? It's going to be all day long, so you won't have any time to get work done, but it's going to be so exciting and some of the most, uh, there's going to be some of the most amazing speakers. The reality is, having known that I've already said yes to this conference, and yet, um, I can assess my physical. So research. what I notice, let me yeah, let me pull back. So what I notice you doing is is shifting away in this moment when it became a little bit too real. I notice how quickly you shifted away from body cues and into analyzing, and how the more real it felt, the more disconnected you were from your body. Um, does that feel true for you? Yeah, I think so. I think I was also just amused. giving some context. Yeah, yeah. Totally, totally. Um, but in terms of cues in your body, when I say take that off work and go to this conference tomorrow, what do you notice? Back to levels of tension, kind of the more what I would call like heavy tension than like excited tension kind of all going through my core here. Mm. Um, and there's a sort of like harder to breathe feeling, like can't quite get a full breath. Um, yeah, it just, it feels heavy. Mm. And it's a feeling I'm familiar with because I put myself in this situation a lot um, where I feel like I've just got to get through whatever, like, I'm just going to make it work. This is a thing that's important to me, so I'm just going to make it work. And so my body has this very holding, you know, it's just yeah. sort of like clenching down and just like, all right, we just got to hold it together <laughs> to get through yeah. this thing that we're going to do. Like a battening down the hatches. Um, exactly. Uh. So I feel that sort of thing settling in and this sort of residual feeling in my stomach of like oh god here we go another like exhausting day or weekend or whatever where I'm not gonna have the space that I want to like rest and relax because I just need to grit my teeth and like get through the too many things that I have put <laughs> on my plates so in that moment in that moment when you notice that tensing response in your body and that clenching along your, your, the center of your chest and your stomach. What, um, what is the automatic way that you tend to respond to that? So you said, for example, that you did agree to go to a conference tomorrow. Do you think like in, in that moment where you have that opportunity, did you, do you feel like you felt something similar and then, and then responded how? I think in that moment, I felt less of it because it was far enough off when I started mm. to do it that I could convince myself that it would work out fine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that things will magically be easier in my schedule at that point. Mm -hmm. um, but I think part of that is rationalizing my way away from body mm -hmm. and connectedness here. And I know we just have a couple quick minutes left for questions. 
Um, I wanted to do a mindfulness exercise, but I'll, I'll briefly just kind of explain what it is, what it was, so you can do it if you want to. I talked about it a little bit, but basically just taking some breaths. You can do a full meditation before this if you find it helpful to get more in your body or just kind of imagining some sensory experiences. So like imagining what lavender smells like, imagining yourself on a beach, imagining your feet in the sand, and then thinking about specific moments that you can recall where you made a decision you felt good about, what it felt like before, during, and after in your body, what thoughts you noticed, a decision that you felt not so good about, that what it felt like before, during, and after, and then a decision where it was like uncomfortable, but you knew it was the right thing and how you felt before, during, and after, and then a decision that was uncomfortable, but you knew it wasn't really what was best and how you felt before, during, and after. Um, and that can be just a kind of a helpful way to kind of work backwards to get in touch with your body cues if you're having trouble connecting with that, as well as to just get in touch with like what types of situations, what types of thought processes come up around that. Um, and yeah, I was just gonna say some other suggestions briefly, clarifying your values, seeking out mentors or role models, supportive people for practicing, pausing to check in. And then I'm also gonna send you a worksheet with additional suggestions. Um, yeah, this is now a time for questions. So I'm gonna see what questions are already here as well as see what questions are up on the docket. Um, I will, so I see that there is a question about kids and teens. Um, or folks who just generally don't have a concept of boundaries, such as needing privacy, needing to go to bed at a certain time. I think that that is definitely tough. And I think it's one of those things where like, they don't have to fully understand all the reasons that you're setting a boundary for you to still set that boundary and for that boundary to be valid. Um, and you don't necessarily have to go into a whole lifelong explanation. Um, there's a book called PET, Parent Something Training. My brain can't remember off the top of my head, but that can talk more about that if you're looking for other resources. Um, I think it's Parent Efficacy Training. Um, books on boundaries or boundary setting that you would recommend. Uh, so I find the most helpful ways for about to get in touch with boundaries is just to build a better relationship with yourself and a better sense of self knowledge. Um, and so these are three books that I recommend. Well, two books and one web article that I recommend to do that. Um, I also think it can just be really helpful to spend some time like kind of tracking and noticing, like, when do I feel the best? When are my, when do I feel the most frustrated? When do I feel the most unheard? When do I feel the most seen? Um, and just noticing those kinds of things. Let's see what else we have here. Um, about accepting, there's a question about accepting disrespect. Uh, if it's someone you must have in your life, oof, that's such a tough one. Um, I think this is one of those questions where there are certain things about do I absolutely have to have this person in my life? Or is that something I'm telling myself? Because sometimes that isn't absolutely like maybe you're financially dependent on them or maybe like you can't afford to get another job yet um, or maybe for various reasons, no matter how much you like the idea of it, you feel absolutely obligated to have this family member in your life. Um, I never think you have to accept the disrespect, um, but I think figuring out that how they show up doesn't necessarily mean anything about you, but that doesn't mean it stops hurting. And so I think continuing to make space for that hurt and then having other spaces that you can go after that interaction, minimizing those interactions, setting boundaries in those interactions. Like if you say this thing, I am going to ask you to stop. If you do it again, I'm gonna remind you that that's not okay with me. If you do it a third time, I'm gonna leave the conversation entirely or you know, leave the house, leave the workplace, uh, you know, remove myself from speaking to you for the rest of the day. Um, I don't know the full situation, so those are just some generic examples. Uh, I probably won't get to all of these questions, but I'm gonna see what I can do. Um, what if, 
how can you differentiate between your yes and your no if you can't tell the difference? Um, so I think more and more, I think that there are going to be subtle differences. And I think if you're having trouble sensing the difference, it's probably because you're not totally grounded or not totally present in your body or because you're starting with like kind of complex examples. So it's kind of difficult to figure out. So I would start with examples that feel very, very obvious um, what the yes and what the no is. And I would do everything you can to kind of get yourself in a grounded place first. Um, and also if you're having, if you're still having trouble thinking about what thoughts you noticed, what feelings you noticed, anything else you noticed when you made a decision where it was like, where you felt good about it. And then when you made a decision where you were like, that was not a good choice. You can work backwards that way too. Um, let's see. How do you release guilt around new behavior when it feels so real in your body? That's a really good one. Thank you, Georgina. Um, release guilt. I think trying to figure out for starters, because I think that's a step down the line, but I think an earlier step is just figuring out how do you acknowledge that guilt doesn't mean what we've learned that it means. So I think often we've learned that guilt means I'm doing bad or I'm wrong or I screwed up. Um, whereas guilt absolutely doesn't have to mean that. I have an article on my website, which I'm going to link you to, that talks more in detail about other things guilt can mean and how to have different relationships with guilt based on your kind of like, oh, it's that type of guilt. Kind of naming the type of guilt it is can make it easier to get a little bit more space. Um, and um, let's see, how do you set a boundary when it comes to wanting alone time for recharging? Um, especially when it comes to your significant other not respecting it and always wanting to spend time with you 24 seven. That is incredibly hard. Um, and I think, um, I love all these questions, by the way, they're super thoughtful questions and I wish that I had more time. Um, certainly you're welcome to reach out to me on my website, but yeah, briefly, I would say having a conversation with your significant other about it when it is not in the moment of distress, like when you're feeling like you do want to spend time with your significant other, having a conversation about it then and how it feels for you and seeing if they have something that they can relate to your need on and saying that like how you're going to be more present and more there when you're there if you're able to have this need met. Um, I also think, you know, more long-term strategies that would involve things like couples counseling um, and would involve things like just saying, you know, this is a need even if you are uncomfortable with it and try not to dictate your boundaries according to that, but it's hard. Um, I know we're coming to the very end. I know it is, oop, it's definitely time. So I won't, uh keep you all um i really really appreciate you coming um and i think it should automatically link you to the website at the end of this um which is again samsilvermantherapy.com um i really really appreciate you all coming uh i know i can't cover everything about boundaries but i'm grateful for your attendance and feel free to reach out to me thanks all